Good evening and welcome to the inaugural election of Archaeology Hour, a free public monthly webinar created by the Archaeological Institute of America. My name is Andy Goldman and I'm the president of the Spokane Society of the AIA, as well as a professor uh, of archaeology and history at Gonzaga University in Spokane, Washington. Uh, local societies have been asked to act as the hosts for this new series and the Spokane Society is honored to be the first uh, in what looks like a really exciting year of talks. Uh, here in Spokane, uh, we are celebrating our 75th anniversary. <clears throat> and um, we're very, very excited um, if uh, any of you are in the region to uh, have people join us for one of our talks, which are free and open to the public. Uh, held on the third Thursday of the month at 6.30 p.m. at the Northwest Museum of Arts and Culture, uh, we, we call the MAC. Uh, do check out our Facebook page uh, for more information about our local series, uh, as well as information about our new website, which will go live in just a few weeks. Uh, the Spokane Society actually dates back a bit further than 75 years. Um, we have materials in the MAC archives uh, to show that AIA talks were first held in Spokane in 1905, when scholars from the East Coast were sent out by the AIA to speak to gatherings here in what was then the very distant West Coast. Uh, scholars from East Coast institutions like Harvard and Johns Hopkins, um, both men and women, made their way across the country to the rail, mining, and timber hub that is Spokane, Washington. Uh, where the population at the time was doubling, uh, even tripling every decade in the early years of this city. Um, even then, there was an intense interest in archaeology within the community, um, although it was only decades later, in 1948, um, that we our society was uh, fully founded. In 1905, travel by train was slow, uh, lectures were illustrated by slide lantern, uh, and some of our talks, if you read the archives, were over two hours long. Uh, here we are 120 years or so later, still hosting lectures, uh, but now you can watch our AIA lectures from the comfort of your own home uh, with excellent color illustrations. And yes, I promise a single hour this evening. Uh, the Spokane Society um, is offering seven local talks this year for those in our region from September to April with topics which include fieldwork in Egypt, Cyprus, Italy, Northumberland, and Sicily. Uh, I'm perhaps most excited about our uh, next talk on October 20th uh, featuring Dr. Scott Williams who will speak to us about the Galleon Santo Cristo de Burgos, uh, which was a um, 19th or sorry, 17th century wreck, which has just been identified off the Oregon coast and was featured in the New York Times recently, just this summer. Uh, it dumped literally tons of beeswax uh, off the coast, material which was mined um, for centuries in the area. And we'll hear about this 16 year project uh, that only recently culminated in a positive identification of the ship. Uh, we hope with the permission of Dr. Williams uh, to post a recording uh, of this talk on our YouTube site and uh, just Google Spokane AIA Society YouTube uh, to access this upcoming talk as well as several of our past previous lectures. Uh, finally, for those of you who are in our area, um, you might think about uh, consider joining uh, members of the AIA and other archeological institutions in our region for Spokane Archeology span Day, which has returned on October 1st, Saturday from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. on the campus of the MAC in Brown's edition on First Street. Um, it's a free family-friendly event, uh, which is open to all with lectures, activities, and more. Um, we'll be there talking about AIA membership and our lecture series, please drop by our booth if you're in the area. But now on to our lecture for this evening about which I'm quite excited. Uh, our speaker is Dr. Krish Sita, uh, an associate professor in the Department of Anthropology at Stanford University. Uh, Dr. Sita is an environmental archeologist specializing in zooarchaeology with an educational background in biology, health studies, and ecology. Uh, his research integrates archaeological, historical, anthropological, and client-simus data 
and approaches. Since 2008, he has directed the Mauritian Archaeological and Heritage, or MAC, project, which focuses on bringing the unique and rich archaeological past of Mauritius to a wide audience. MAC engages um, with a scientific approach to historical archaeology. The project centers on the movements of peoples and material cultures, specifically within the contexts of slavery uh, and diaspora, and focuses on key sites on the island nation of Mauritius. Using a systematic program of excavation and environmental sampling, the underlying aims of the Mauritian Archaeological and Cultural Heritage Project are to better understand the transition from slavery to indentured labor following abolition, the extent and diversity of trade of the region, and the environmental consequences of intense monocultural agriculture. His talk this evening is entitled New Approaches to the Archaeology of Disease, colon, Climate, Imperialism, and Malaria in the Indian Ocean. Please welcome Dr. Sita. Thank you very much. That's such a lovely introduction. I'll just quickly start sharing my screen and then we can begin. There we go. I hope everybody can see that well. Andrew, thank you so much. And thank you to the AIA and uh, over 200 participants. I'm so grateful that you are joining us all here today. And I'm, I'm just, it's just such an honor to be um, starting this series as the first one in this particular series. Um, Andrew, thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. I'll skip my own background about biology, health and ecology. The only thing I'll mention is that as of the 1st of September, a little plug for something that I think has been really a positive development for Stanford is that I'm part of the inaugural faculty for the new school, Stanford's Dewar School of Sustainability. Um, which will actually hopefully be give me an opportunity to bring some of the longitudinal perspectives from our work to bear on issues of sustainability that we face today. Um, just to mention, I'll be focusing on vector-borne diseases, but I just ask you for your indulgence. Andrew was very kind to mention the systematic approach that we've taken to work in Mauritius, and I'd just like to present a little bit of that to you, if I may. Um, we're very keen to align topics as disparate as heritage, with things like ecological, genomic, and data sciences. And I wanna make that very clear to you today during the presentation. And basically the point of this presentation is to try to show that while heritage research has been one very important way for us to help connect with local groups and bring knowledge of their past to those groups and also to the wider international audience, I really hope that I'm able to show um, the potential for more concrete and powerful ways to leverage and utilize longitudinal data sets for the benefit of humanity more broadly. In other words, how can archaeology contribute practically in an applied way to the major challenges facing humanity? And very much for me, by using the inherent multidisciplinarity, the time depth of archaeology, the work I present seeks an integrated understanding of malaria something we still don't have after over a, sci over a century of scientific investigation. Uh, just help me move along. Next slide. There we go. So subject, oops, sorry, subjects like archaeology, anthropology, the social sciences in general have shown us that disease is a much more complex thing, a much more complex topic than the direct impacts on the body. And I don't need to make that case. I mean, in the past, it was always a, a moment to try to say, think about the impact of epidemic disease. I don't need to make that case for you at all now. You know the impacts on society that disease can have very, very vividly. As a global community, we've lived that. But when we're talking about malaria, we want to understand what drives malaria. And we already understand that strong links exist between malaria and land use. But how has this changed over time as we increasingly modify landscapes? And I've got four images of that here. How will malaria and other vector-borne diseases impact future populations? But I just I'll start in a more simple way, a, a much more basic question. How old is malaria? And I'll make it very easy for you. You might have said to me, malaria, several hundred, several thousand years old. In fact, malaria is over 30 million years old. The form of malaria that affects humans probably left Africa with us. And so I really want to use that 
over a complete overstatement, but just use that to say time depth is really critical. Longitudinal perspectives are really critical to understanding malaria. Now we're not going back as far as several hundred or thousands of years. We're using the last three to 400 years because of the context of colonialism and how that impacted the world. And in particular, the changes it made. Today, malaria poses a threat to over half of the world's population and future impacts remain highly uncertain due to risks posed by climate change, things that we're having an impact on. And this really underscores the need for us to think of new ways to study a disease like malaria, but also other vector-borne diseases. Um, in general, modern studies tend to focus on single parameters, such as temperature. Over time, that's so about five to 20 years. In some cases, of course, this is more. But we don't actually, our group don't believe that this is sufficient to truly understand the disease. So we broaden the temporal and spatial context, looking at land use, mobility, policy, transmission over hundreds of years. And then we assess the interrelationships between climate and culture. How did this mitigate or exacerbate the epidemics? So that's the framing I want to, to use, but focusing on the main case study, I'll just spend a few slides situating the research in Mauritius before coming back to the research on malaria itself. Um, I'm, I'm bound to say this as a very proud Mauritian, but Mauritius is a fascinating place. Um, it had no indigenous population. It effectively was colonized during colonialism. Um, and despite this very recent colonial process, it now has one of the highest population, it actually it has the highest population density in Africa, um, alongside one of the longest running democracies and one of Africa's highest GDPs. So it is a contradiction in terms, and it's a very interesting, and exciting place to study. Moreover, for archaeology specifically, historical archaeology of the Indian Ocean world remains much less studied than the Atlantic. So again, within the context of research, at a much broader level, Mauritius is also important in that sense too. Let's just very briefly situate the island, very small island, uh, just over 2,000 kilometers squared um, in landmass, and you'll see it here in relation to the rest of the, the Indian Ocean. Um, just to click, I, I don't want to give you the impression that our, our project has really built off some very important work from around the mid-1990s, um, this is a range of sites. Uh, in fact, Andrew knows a couple of my colleagues who worked on these sites in Mauritius, the Jeff and Francois Summers. Um, we've attempted to add significantly to those sites under investigation. Our team really saw the archaeology of Mauritius as a total, we wanted to take a total approach to it. Um, the sites in red are sites that we've added. These two sites in green are actually much more connected to the ecological context. But for this talk, I'm going to be concentrating on these three sites, Bois Marchand, uh, Quarantine Island, uh, Flat Island, and I'll just touch on um, the more and a, slave pop and a population of the slave people um, that we recovered there. Um, Mauritius went through three periods of, of colonial rule, the Dutch, followed by the French and the British. Under the Dutch, um, there was quite extensive deforestation of the island. Mauritius went from about 98% forest to the present day about 2% natural forest is left. So a huge process of, of deforestation took place almost from the inception of um, colonialism on the island. The French introduced agriculture, sugarcane, and cattle, which had quite a, a, a long, far-reaching impact. Now, under the British, the British recognizing the strategic importance of the island, captured it through superior strength of arms on December 3rd to 1810. And really this marked a, a, a massive and major intensification in sugar. Mauritius was producing between seven and 10% of the world's sugar between 1855 and 59. So that gives you, you know, an island 2000 kilometers squared. That was a staggering transformation in its ecology. And this was basically due to the fact that the British leveled sugar duties across the British colonies. So it made it a, a very strong impetus to produce sugar. One other thing that's critical alongside the landscape change that I've just mentioned is the fact that during the period of, of um, British rule, um, the British had to find another way to, for labor and they instituted the great experiment as a consequence of the abolition and trade in slaves, replacing predominantly African slaves with predominantly Southeast Asia, South Asian sorry, indentured workers. 
I just want to make it clear in Mauritius, the situation is complex. During the period of enslavement, we actually have slaves coming from Asia. And during the period of indenture, we have people coming from Africa as indentured laborers as well. So it's a much more mixed context. But these points, landscape change and demographic, demographic change, are really key to the disease story that I'll mention in a, I'll come back and talk about in a little while. I just want to point to a few things that are just broadening the research context from, from our site specifically. We've looked, we, we undertake the material analysis, the provenancing. This is a really important find, actually. It, it appears to be a shackle um, which corresponds to a, a site that um, basically saw the transition from enslaved labor to indentured labor, but there's a possibility that these shackles were also used during the period of in indenture as well. So it sort of gives us an insight into the treatments of people during a period when we thought the this type of draconian and very forceful um, attitudes to labor had in probability should have waned. In fact, it seems they, they didn't. Uh, some other artifactual analysis, we are undertaking the conservation and preservation of the cultural heritage itself. And I just want to point you to this lower image here. This is actually a, a fingerprint lifted off a ring, which we recovered from one of the cemetery sites that I'll talk to you about. And because of the way that we're able to overlay different types of data sets, we'll effectively be able to match this person's fingerprint with an actual burial record. So I'll come to talk about that in a second. Just want to very briefly skip through a few more of these slides. We're undertaking a very um, uh, extensive program of sediment coring and geophysical analysis. The ecological impacts are a very major focus of our work. Mauritius was the site of the infamous dodo, one of the first animals to become extinct as a consequence of colonialism and the expansion of European ideals, uh, et cetera. So that's um, one thing, looking at the natural biodiversity and how it's been affected, but also looking at all the commensals. So towards the right of this image are all the commensals, and we're actually working um, with a pest control company to, to gather these individual animals and look at their genotype and phenotype. And of course, something that's been really important has been to look at population diversity because of this particular mix of colonial hegemony, hegemony, sorry, hegemony and the multitude of ethnic groups that have come to the island. It's unsurprising that Mauritius has a particularly diverse um, contemporary population. We've undertaken the first modern DNA samples. We've also undertaken extensive archaeological um, sampling for ancient DNA of our populations as well. So that's just a bit of background. I wanted to sort of set the scene for the type of work that we've then gone on to do to concentrate very much on the disease context itself. So pulling out one aspect of that. Now, from this background, I hope it's clear that we really seek a holistic very much a total um, approach to, to the gathering of these data sets. And perhaps um, unsurprisingly, Mauritius also is, because of these ecological and demographic changes, Mauritius emerged as a really remarkable case to study malaria. And in fact, Roland Ross, um, as, who famously unravels this mechanism for, by which malaria is transmitted, um, in India, he undertakes this work, but as soon as he completes that study, the first place he comes um, to undertake a project on eradication is actually Mauritius. So when we look at the antiquity of malaria, establishing a baseline is critical. So with no indigenous population, we can be sure no human strains of malaria were in Mauritius prior to human colonization. However, within 150 years of colonization, Mauritius was suffering from some of the worst epidemics of malaria we've actually um, had recorded uh, for this region of the world. The year 1867, quick um, uh, um, quote there, was really devastating. And some 10% of the population, 41,000 people, were killed in a single year. And you can see the breakdown month by month here um, of the individual mortalities. Now, this catalyzed a huge um, um, development locally. And I want you to remember, this is before malaria, bad air. This is literally a few decades before the word work of Ross. So there was very little understanding of the true mechanism of transmission. And so unfortunately, there was still the idea that bad air was passing this disease around. What we see with this particular um, disruptive and, and massive epidemic, a number of factors. Emigration to Mauritius is entirely suspended. 
um, investments in things like infrastructure and so on really are galvanized. The British put a lot of money into quarantine infrastructure and other infrastructures to deal with disease. And the Bois Marchand Cemetery is established. I'm showing you a small portion. Usually I show a video clip of this, but I didn't, I didn't want to risk um, taking too much time. This is a small portion of the cemetery. It's still a functioning cemetery today. It was 400 acres at the time it was inscribed. That was the largest cemetery in the Indian Ocean and the third largest in the world, simply because so many people were dying on such a rapid scale. The small cemeteries of the capital, Port Louis, couldn't deal with it, and they instituted this huge cemetery. It, this road here is actually the main highway through Mauritius. It cut right through the cemetery. This is a, an hour chicken processing plant. Uh, of course, portions of this have now found modern uses, but this was an absolutely critical site um, for malaria epidemics during that period. Uh, we have some wonderful historical resources. Indeed, we have, uh, and unfortunately, I don't have too much time to explain this map, but this map was the, the linchpin. This was the critical find that allowed us to uncover a portion of the cemetery that remained untouched since 1867 and 68. So since the original epidemic, because of this idea of bad air, a portion of the cemetery, which we estimate between 700 and 1,000 individuals were buried, remained untouched. And you might just be able to make out um, uh, in this um, uh, zoomed image here, Hindu, Hindu, and plague. So Hindu is ascribing and, and, and connecting to the Indian um, indentured diaspora and plague was a sort of catch-all term used to describe epidemic disease at that time. In addition to this uh, burial, um, the, these wonderful map, we've also got burial records that date back, would you believe, to 1867 and 68. And we've got over a hundred archives back to this period um, with a whole host of information, including the names, the origin, the cause of death, the place of death, etc. So we can really start to tease out the micro histories of these individuals and also start to connect mortality profiles across the, the island itself and look at the microclimates and the impacts that they had. I'm going to come back and touch on that work. All of these records are effectively being digitized and in the process of analysis. And I'll just touch on results that we've had from there in a second. Um, but I just want to give you some image, show you some images as well of the type of work that we undertake. Uh, very easy to note the rich red soil. This is highly volcanic, which is possibly some of the worst soils for preservation. Yet we've still been successful with um, DNA analysis and other molecular techniques that are providing a lot of information from us about the individual's diet, et cetera, et cetera, and of course their demography. Another site I just touched on very briefly, Bois Marchand is really a key site for us. So too is Flat Island Quarantine Station. Um, for obvious reasons, what we have from here, we've just, uh, we've done a number of seasons of survey. My colleague, Alessandra Chanchozzi has just finished a season over this summer with colleagues. We've just been working out in Flat Island. Um, actually starting in the process of clearing this site and understanding some of the complexity. There were two hospital blocks here. There were separations of the Europeans from the indentured laborers. Um, there's also cemetery sites. So again, there's gonna be another signal of um, both uh, uh, human demography, but possibly uh, parasite pathogen demography, uh, um, sorry, genetics as well, before anybody even reaches Mauritius. So the complexity of these sites really give us good hope, um, uh, good capacity to understand malaria and disease specifically within this context. I just wanna move and, and transition slightly away from the sites and, and start talking very briefly about the data sets that we're drawing on. And of course, it, it probably goes without saying that we are working with a large network of colleagues and we're really dependent on a, on a great network of really good colleagues that are helping us with this work. And I'll start with the historical data, which has been absolutely critical in terms of contextualizing and situating the work that we're finding as archeologists. Um, historical records are providing excellent evidence from the instrumental record itself. So that's basically records of temperature, cli other climatic information, but also there's a host of socioeconomic and political um, um, developments that we're seeing through the archival records that really help us situate what the social transitions were and the political transitions at that time and how we fit that into our understanding of disease in society. 
just very briefly, there's nothing new about dendrochronology, excuse me, or the use of shells. The point I want to make here is that for this part of the world, for this region broadly, not just Mauritius, the whole region, we have very few data sets of this type. So we really need to establish these records in order to develop a concrete and usable dating profile. Um, something much more innovative is actually the use of coral as a climate proxy. So we look at these large, what we are commonly termed brain corals, these porites corals, they can give us a climate record of about three to 500 years in some cases. The latter is very rare, but we're looking at two to 300 years. And through powder diffraction, so we work with um, the colleagues up at Slack and uh, to, to, for powder diffraction, basically using high energy um, laser ablation to look at the microcrystalline structure of these corals. And what that tells us is sea surface temperature. So we've got a way to, to know the, the changing fluctuations in temperature, which is a critical measure of um, malaria transmission, mosquito activity, in fact. But also we see nitrogen use and, and sediment runoff, which are indicators and markers of agriculture. And that's a really key point. I'm gonna come back to that in a second. Um, the other thing that's really important to our work is a whole slew of genomic evidence that we're developing. Um, my colleague Rosa Frahal works on the demography and my other colleague Martin Sikora works specifically on um, the DNA of Plasmodium falciparum, the parasite itself, um, and has done some excellent work. Really, we're pushing the, the boundaries of the capacity for us to do this work and from ever smaller samples of, of uh, biological archaeological material to actually be able to look for these signals of the disease. Um, perhaps unsurprisingly, we're also adopting a lot of approaches from modern disease ecology with help from colleagues in, in contemporary epidemiology and modern disease study. We work with colleagues who are malariologists themselves, um, basically to try to understand how we're going to bring our evidence from the past to bear on the present day. And it maybe isn't a surprise that we have very large data sets ourselves, and we're working with a data scientist, a data manager, basically, to help us um, using machine learning and other forms of artificial intelligence, data science, not really artificial intelligence, for um, sorry, mapping and modeling our data. And I'll say to you, I'll come back and talk about some of those results in just a second, if you bear with me. But basically, summarizing and recapping some of our data sets here. I hope it's clear we've got extremely rich, very large data sets. We've got over 2,500 skeletons from which to assess demographic and disease context. And, and this is the type, this gives us the type of statistical robusticity that we need to be able to take information from an archaeological context and bring it to bear on what we're seeing in the present day. But all of these data sets are studied alongside human and parasitic vector DNA as well. We've got archival records on disease, on climate, on demography. And of course, as I said to you, we've got sediment and coral cores to give us this very precise um, understanding of the climatic context at that time. And while we're still in the process of gathering data, of course, we've started to uh, have some analytical process. I hope I've, I've given you a, a fair impression of the size and scale of the work involved. Um, I want to illustrate some of the strengths of the project and just touch on a few outcomes, um, hopefully to make the case for why this approach is something that actually has validity and moves us from the context of um, sort of understanding the archaeological um, circumstances, but moving that towards something that could potentially be useful for the, for the contemporary populations of, of the modern world, basically. We, with our coral data, with our historical archives, our team is able to overlay the historical records of malaria deaths with the archival records of temperature. So I'm just very quickly showing you a very rough historical diagram of temperature here alongside our coral information. Um, the coral is providing evidence of agricultural change over time. Now, remarkably, with the coral as well as the historical archives are all accurate to the monthly scale. Now, this unique synthesis of disparate data allows us for the very first time to concretely link mortality with land use. I believe it or not, it's something that we've not been able to do because while we, in the present day, we might have a snapshot, we, we know the um, mortality profile and we can have a snapshot of land use, it's relatively static. We're looking at this over time 
And so we're able to make the connections between mortality and land use over a period of time because these data sets are actually accurate to that level, despite being historical and climatic records themselves. Um, from our excavations, I mentioned to you the extent to which we're undertaking coral, uh, sorry, sorry, excuse me, sediment coring from uh, a, a range of sites on the island. Of course, we, we will, we anticipate recovering the egg casings. We, in soil cores generally, you recover um, fragments of insects, and we expect to recover the egg casings of the mosquitoes themselves from the soil cores taken from our archaeological context. So this actually will provide us the DNA of the specific species of vector, so the mechanism of transmission, aligned with the climate data from the core itself. So if you imagine the core already has a well stratified, well, we can date it, well dated sequence that's given us climate information, within that we should be able to recover the egg casings. The DNA from that egg casing allows us to understand how climate influence the genomics of this vector, of the mosquito itself. This is absolutely crucial for understanding transmission. But perhaps the furthest reaching methodological innovation, particularly speaking from the perspective of an archeologist, um, somebody who's very much trained in the social, and social sciences and humanities. One of the things that's really innovative for us is the use of data science toolkits to analyze our data. So it's relatively clear, I hope, that we have these massive, very complex, interdependent data sets. Um, we've effectively advanced, um, and I say that very respectfully, we've advanced the types of tools that uh, Google, for example, uses. Google effectively studies your search history to train its algorithms. Well, we're literally using history, as well as climatic, archaeological, genomic data, to train our algorithms to, to seek patterns between outbreaks, between outbreaks and mortality profiles, vectors, climate, and human activity. And our AI, although we're still at an early stage, is already revealing some counterintuitive um, results. From those burial archives, we've been, um, we've had those digitized through various um, su studies supported by Stanford BPUE, um, Vice Provost for Undergraduate Education has supported undergraduates on our project digitizing those archives. Those have been transformed into a platform and uh, we have an excellent intern um, who's working with us now, basically who's interpolated those results. And from his results, what we've seen is that if you end up contracting malaria during this period, and you go to hospital. Now, in the present day, we would anticipate if you go to hospital, you're probably going to, it's going to improve your health. You'll probably have a better chance of survival. In fact, what we're seeing is that if you end up in hospital, having contracted malaria, you're more likely to die. Now, as these results were coming out in November of last year, I was in Mauritius doing some work and actually looking at um, global health uh, studies in Mauritius at that time and reading some of the history as it turned out, for the indentured laborers, because they were provided uh, with a salary, they had to buy their own food. Often the rations were, were quite um, relatively low. So they were generally mal malnourished. When they contracted malaria, that debilitated them further. Because of their salary, they actually wouldn't take time off to go to hospital or seek medical care. Because if they took that day off, they were doctor day's pay. So in order to avoid seeking healthcare, they would continue working to earn the money. That meant that by the time they ended up in hospital, they were on the cusp of dying anyway. And malaria, there's a, there's a scientific aspect to this as well. Malaria sort of goes into a slight dormancy if the body is malnourished. It comes back the moment there's food with a vengeance. So that starts to explain some of these, these archeological conundrums, these, these historical conundrums that we're finding, we would never have revealed that without the AI um, seeking these patterns, but we actually find an explanation for that when we come back to the historical records and we understand much more completely what was actually happening in that context to these laboring peoples. So just as I, as I wrap up this case, um, the, the study itself and, and the presentation, I'm hoping I'm coming, trying to, I tried to finish in about 30 minutes, I'm, I'm on track to do that. In addition to the sites that we have in Mauritius, 
Um, we've also been working uh, to integrate sites from Italy. Um, we've got a colleague working in, the, in Bosnia at the moment. Um, the Balkans had these plague valleys. So we're, we're undertaking a comparison between the Southern Hemisphere and the Northern Hemisphere. We're also developing a case study in Zimbabwe of endemic malaria. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to Madagascar next week for, on another project, but also looking at how we might be able to integrate Madagascar into this project. And I work on another project um, looking at Rift Valley fever in Kenya. Basically, the idea is just to apply this approach. You can see that there's an approach behind this that really helps us to understand disease in a much more complex and concrete way. Um, and I just want to point out before I, I move from this slide, these, um, oops, sorry, this, these maps are actually historical malaria maps. So it gives you some indication of the amount of data present in the archaeological and historical record that we can draw on today to better understand how the disease is going to affect us in the future. So ultimately, as I wrap the presentation up, I just I basically want to show the outcomes that we're really aiming for, the societal and scientific out outcomes that we aim for, our synchronized database on malaria. This is um, by using these many lines of evidence gathered over hundreds of years. The project basically represents a paradigm shift in the way that we study how disease impacted society. And while a, a synchronized database on malaria is obviously um, something of utility, but what we hope is that we want to take this concept and, and tackle a class of problems by it being applied to other vector-borne diseases, but also other human environmental challenges, principally climate change. So we can use this approach in other ways. And ultimately, the greatest impact we aim with this, with this type of work is that this project effectively shows how we can operationalize the past for the benefit of humanity. And I'll just make a shameless plug for a book um, that won the SAA Book Award a couple of a few years ago, and there's many, many acknowledgements. Lots of people have helped us, and I'm very grateful to them all. And I'm extremely grateful for your attention this evening. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Krish. And if we were live, we would hear thunderous applause, I think, and certainly calls for more information. Uh, if you do have a question for our speaker, um, we are using the Q&A. Oh, there's lots of uh, little applause hands and thumbs up. Excellent. And um, so if you have, um, I guess, a more uh, complex reaction and you have some questions for our speaker, please put them in the Q&A box and we'll get to as many as we can before we wind up our hour this evening um, with a few slides and reminders. Um, so um, starting at the top, um, Dave Bartel asks, um, why is volcanic soil the, quote, worst for preservation? Thank you very much. Um... It's very rich in iron, which tends to damage the bone, and particularly the outer cortical surface very quickly. There's an oxidation process that's taking place in that soil, which is why the, the, it's so rich itself. So it tends to demineralize, particularly the outer cortex, and that makes the bone extremely friable. It, it, thankfully, it doesn't affect the, the molecular capacity. It just weakens the structure of the bone itself. Okay, uh, from Bruce Hector, um, he asks, could you please comment on osteological or other detectable information related to malaria that can be obtained from the skeletons? Yes, so it's, uh, I, I tended to push straight towards the molecular techniques. We're also using some proteomic, trying to develop some proteomic um, um, testing because if the genes don't make themselves present of the pathogen itself, the expression of the gene in the proteins may make themselves present. And I, I didn't actually show you, but there is um, a tissue basically in some of the coffins and discoloration, which we think may be capturing the breakdown, the adipose tissue during the breakdown, the decomposition process, which is something we're testing as well. But aside from that, gross morphological markers are things like cribra orbitalia, which is pitting underneath the eyes, um, um, hyperostosis of the bone as well. Those two um, uh, markers are actually indicative of anemia. So it, it's not a direct correlation with malaria because many things can give us anemia, many um, deficiencies, many um, malnutrition, et cetera, et cetera. Many conditions can lead to a deficiency in iron, which leads to um, anemia. But it's a fairly strong, because anemia being one of the key signals of malaria, it's a fairly strong indicator, even if it's not sort of a smoking gun 
type indicator. The other thing as well is hemozoin. So when the malaria parasite attacks the red blood cells and they start to break down, they leave hemozoin, basically the iron rich corpuscles um, component of the, the uh, blood cells themselves, they accumulate in the bone. So there is very interesting, very important work. Um, the name is Teddy Setzer, does some excellent work on, on hemozoin as, as other colleagues who work very closely on that. And that's something that we're integrating as well. As I mentioned to you, I haven't, we haven't looked at all of the sites. I didn't touch on all the sites. We've got sites with much better preservation. Um, where we are in, in Bois Marchand, that site is, is critical because of its um, relationship to the malaria epidemic. But as I say to you, we struggle a little bit because things like hemozoin are not preserved in that kind of preservation context. I hope that addresses the question. Uh, Dorothy Griffiths uh, has a question that I'm very curious to know the answer for. Um, as an archaeologist, I'm curious to find out how did the team of archaeologists equip themselves with safety gears, safety gear, as they made their headway, made their way into this contaminated site to recover the archaeological and historical data? How did you secure these finds as well as yourselves as you unearthed them, having foreknowledge of the seriously dangerous health risk at hand? Um, malaria is transmitted by mosquitoes, not bad air, so it presented no danger to us whatsoever. Also, we're talking about 150 plus years, um, so we were not at risk from, from any epidemics or anything like that at all. I, I, it's actually a point well made, though, because locally there was some concern. Um, and in fact, initially, the Ministry of Health, which provides our permits for this work, addressing the other component of that question, the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Arts and Culture, we work very closely with, with um, the hugely supportive in Mauritius, and I should mention the Afro-Rassi Trust Fund, who help us with this work because it's connected to indenture. Everybody's massively supportive. Initially, they wanted to spray every single inhumation that we opened up. And in fact, that only introduces um, contaminants, which are very likely to destroy the DNA preservation, um, which is already at risk anyway. So we, we, were, we were not affected. We, we had no risk to ourselves. The epidemics are long past and malaria is not transmitted via bad air anyway. Um, but it was something actually that we took caution in anyway. Okay. Um, Tony Osabelli asked, what is the current state of malaria on the island? A another, sorry, I really can't believe I missed that. M Mauritius is important for malaria because it had no malaria at all, no endemic malaria, no human population, so no human strains of malaria. Then it became epidemic. And it's one of the few places that has actually eliminated. And I'm very careful of saying eradicated because eradicated means it's gone for good. And uh, malaria is something that has a tendency to come back. So we've eliminated malaria twice, in fact. In fact, malaria has been eliminated with DDT. Um, it came, a small spike came back in this, uh, um, after this initial process of elimination. And then we've been malaria free. However, I just want to mention dengue, chikungunya, other, um, other uh, diseases passed by mosquitoes have caused a problem in Mauritius. Um, and so we're, we're very cautious about that. Uh, the idea with this project is to basically establish a complete, you know, basically the, the, the ideal case study for studying malaria, uh, no malaria, very much an epidemic state and then eliminated and look at that transition and how the mosquito and how the parasite itself, how they are interacting with human populations and how human populations have helped that. The thing I just want to mention is that DDT, um, eradication is itself, sorry, eradication elimination is itself a problem. DDT had huge impacts on local ecology. Uh, one of the reasons I showed you, I didn't mention it, but I showed you the Mauritian kestrel, which is the one time rarest bird in the world. We were down to about four or five individuals, I think, yeah. in part because DDT had thinned the egg casings of the bird and they weren't viable. We still have a very high rate of DDT in female and human breast milk to this day in Mauritius. So DDT has its own problems. How we eradicate, how we eliminate has its consequences. And that's what the longitudinal lens can help us unravel. Okay. Um, Holly Bluer asks, uh, Dr. Sita, 
Could you discuss the link between lactase persistence and malaria? Is this something that has been part of your research? Lactase persistence and malaria? Um, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit confused. Hmm. Um, well, I'm not sure about the question. Me, perhaps, perhaps Holly can um, clarify that a little bit more um, in the Q&A box. Um, let's move to another question. Um, Bruce Hector uh, mentions, uh, clinically and historically, I believe that different species of plasmodia were determined by fever cycles like every two or four days. Do you have medical records to consult? And if so, how do they contribute to your data set? Yeah, at the moment, that is an absolutely, I, I really, that's it. That's a, a gap we wish we could fill. We don't have medical records at the moment that we can draw on. Um, we are seeking those. Those are the type of records which, which I hope will help explain why we have northern and southern hemisphere, sorry, southern and northern hemisphere case studies. Those are the type of records that were recorded and kept very close track of from Italy. And Italy had one of really, unfortunately, because it had such a high burden of malaria, it also developed a wonderful science of malaria and recording those kinds of cycles. So in Italy, um, there are um, the same seasonal cycles, but there are also these um, five-year cyclical epidemics that break out that are much more, much more debilitating to the local community. All of those data sets are being pulled into our work at the moment. But for Mauritius at the moment, we haven't uncovered the types of records that the, that the um, you're sorry, I didn't catch the person's name, but that's absolutely critical and that'd be really useful for us because at the moment we can't be entirely sure what strain of malaria we have, um, nor the exact vector, because at a certain point in time, ship transport moves so quickly that it's able to move somebody in a short enough space of time that they keep the parasite within their body for an entire cycle. And they might be leaving India or another part of, of that coast, and they're still carrying the disease by the time they've reached Mauritius, or they've passed it on and it's still active. So it's a bit of a complicated situation that we need to try and unravel, and that would be a very insightful way to do it. Yeah, and in fact, in a related question, um, how are egg cases of mosquitoes preserved well enough to be recovered? Or, <clears throat> or the, the questioner asks if uh, she's missing part of your explanation. No, it's absolutely right. I mean, we already recovered chironomids. The outer casings of some of these um, larvae of flying midges, the same family, in the, the, the same kind of broad family as, um, as mosquitoes come from, we recovered the, the outer casings. Those are particularly durable. What happens in many of these uh, soil, what we're actually seeking specifically, are soil cores, sediment cores, that have been in waterlogged context. So they're anaerobic, there's a very slow process of decay, and the preservation is usually extremely good for things like pollen, uh, chironomid, egg, uh, chironomid casings themselves, the outer shell of these insects as they shed their shells when they go from a larval stage to being the flying stage, et cetera, et cetera. So this is just a, this is a, um, a little bit complicated to explain. We know we have these things in an archeological context. We haven't really spent the time to tease out whether um, they do actually recover the DNA themselves. So that's something that we're processing now. We're trying to sort of, well, I can only say we tried to pioneer that within this project. But if we do actually have the egg casings, we've got the DNA of the vector, and that's a really critical advance. Just amazing. Um, Nancy Serwin asks, um, can you protect, uh, can you connect the particular land use and cultivation practices on the island to the rise in malaria at particular times? That is it, that is exactly what we hope to do when we can align the coral data with the, um, the archival records. Now, the thing I didn't really go into much detail, I mentioned um, um, cattle being introduced. Now, cattle have a particular impact. We think of cattle as relatively benevolent, but actually they open up forests. They allow other commensals to, to penetrate forests. They can be quite damaging to ecosystems because of the, the, the kind of change that they do, they make to landscapes um, that allow other commensals to um, decimate local bird populations, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, cattle also enrich soils through their waste. Um, and that 
signal ends up in lagoon. So along with natural fertilizer and also artificial fertilizers added to the soil, sugarcane, it needs fertilizer. Um, agriculture generally relies on, agri on, on fertilizer. So that very quickly changes the amount of nitrogen going into the lagoons. The lagoons are a really sensitive system. They respond very quickly to these increases in nitrogen by having uh, blooms of certain types of plants over others. The other thing as well, the Dutch in particular, Mauritius had quite a lot of mangrove around the coast, but this was um, generally cut off. And the mangrove tends to be a bit of a buffer between what's happening on land and what's happening in the lagoon. It buffers between both. Once that, once that has been removed, and we also have quite high rainfall, so it's just creating a runoff, a wash off into the lagoon. And those signals have been caught in the coral. Um, we, we actually have some coral cores already. It's just a process of getting them analyzed, but we're working on a much broader um, a survey program of corals around the island because it, it wouldn't really benefit us. I mean, if all we had was one coral, that would be what we'd have to work with. But we'd like a stream uh, of, of corals, we'd like a cohort of corals around the island to be able to see the differences in various lagoon runoffs at different parts of the island itself to really give us a very concrete climatic profile. Excellent. Um, let's turn, uh, while we still have a bit more time, to the cemeteries. We have a couple questions on that. Um, uh, Shanti Morel Hart says, amazing work, thank you. Can you speak a bit to the excavation of individuals in the cemetery? She recalls, uh, you said there were 2,500 people represented in your data set. Does that represent the number of excavations or are there additional human remains that you were able to work with apart from the excavations? Yeah. Um... Thank you for the question, Shanti. Good to hear from you. Um, the, uh, we have around a thousand individuals from our sites in Mauritius based on um, preliminary excavations that we've been undertaking since, Bois Marchand we've been looking at since 2011. Um, I've been very cautious to excavate large numbers of skeletons because we don't have a large grant behind us at the moment. We're putting applications in as we speak, but it, it would be completely the wrong thing to excavate without knowing that we can actually undertake the full suite of, of analyses that we want to, to do. So we're sure um, through various um, surveys and, and, and excavations on, we just excavated another a new cemetery, maybe about four or five cemeteries in Mauritius already. Conservatively, we've got about a thousand individuals there. We've got probably about the same number of individuals from Zimbabwe in collections that have already been excavated. And we're negotiating whether we could work with those before we actually excavate anything new. Um, but we also have um, a large number of excavated and new materials coming out from our Northern Hemisphere case studies um, in, in uh, Northern Europe, basically, uh, the Mediterranean region, I should say, and the Adriatic coast. I've been quite conservative with two and a half thousand individuals because I know there's probably already about a thousand already individuals excavated for a couple of monastery excavations that have already taken place. There's been analysis, but there hasn't been the molecular assessment that we would like to undertake. So we've got, um, I, I uh, put it like this, we have access to those individuals. I think we're actually being conservative, um, but we've established based on initial surveys and excavations over the last decade, the numbers of individuals that we have. So we can be quite certain in our accuracy. And as I say to you, we're probably underestimating. Okay. Um, I wanted to return to Holly Bluer's question about the lactase persistence. Uh, she did write in, there's a research paper titled Lactase Persistence Genotypes and Malaria Susceptibility in the Fulani of Mali, which discusses the slight protection from malaria provided by right. lactose intolerance. This particular right. study is on the a Fulani ethnic group. And uh, okay. she's interested about that. Sorry, it's not an area I'm an expert in. Um, I do know about lactase intolerance and, and students of mine have studied that. It's, it's something that we've done in our lab. Um, what I would say is that our approach, I, I haven't seen the paper, so I can only hold my hands up and obviously I'll be reading that paper tomorrow. Um, but what we are looking at is things like the Duffy allele. So these are uh, genetic markers that, um, for example, sickle cell anemia is a response to malaria. 
there's a whole slew across um, parts of, of, of Greece and the Mediterranean in general, thalassemia B, these are all genetic responses to malaria um, because it's effectively changed our genome. Malaria has, has had a huge impact on, on um, organisms around the world, plants and anim sorry, animals across many, many taxa. So um, those are the alleles that we're looking at uh, because they will give us an indication. There's, there's a sort of interesting story here because during the French period, apparently there isn't a single record of a malaria um, case during that whole period, which seems staggering to anyone that I speak to and including to myself. It may be that it just wasn't recorded. That's, that's fair enough. But what could have been happening was that people were coming predominantly from Africa and they had certain protection to the form of malaria that may have been present. What may have then happened was that with the influx of people coming from South Asia, they brought malaria falciparum, which is a much more debilitating form of malaria and which can account for vivax and nolesii, the other forms of malaria. They tend not to have that kind of impact on a population, mortality on a population whereas falciparum can actually lead to about a 10% mortality rate um, in a population that it affects. So maybe we're seeing a situation where a new form of malaria was brought to the island and the people locally didn't have um, natural resilience to it or the other way around, people were coming and they were affected by whichever forms of malaria were in Mauritius at the time. And that's a really exciting question to try to tease out and understand. And it links directly to the types of things that um, our colleague just mentioned in terms of lactose, lactase intolerance. A lot of these things actually have a coupled nature to them. One thing is trying to help out because we were affected by so many, um, these things are sort of in, so in conflict with each other, of course, but they do offer some um, protection in another way. Okay, um, one final question related actually is from uh, Larry Garrity. Um, can you tell whether the rate of disease differs with different ethnic groups? Has your, have you been able to? Well, that's, yes. So that's exactly what we're trying to do with the ancient um, DNA work. Uh, it looks, there's a little bit of a complication in this, in that um, enslaved people were afforded some health care um, during the period of enslavement. And, just a plug for the talk on whatever day is next week where we talk about the medicinal practice of enslaved people. Um, but after emancipation, enslaved people really, particularly those who have moved to the coast or those who are resisting slavery, they have extremely little health, access to healthcare. And um, so there is a, a complicated situation. Is it the disease that's causing debilitation and mortality? Or is it the lack of healthcare and poor nutrition? It's something that's difficult to tease out. Now, I think we can actually do that because isotope signals and other indicators of diet give us some information about things like our nutrition. We have good information about the kind of working life. So we might be able to see somebody who's reasonably healthy despite a hard working life or poor nutrition and affected by disease, or we might not be able to tease that out as clearly as that we would like. There is the possibilities of figuring it out. The other side of that complication is that when indentured laborers do come, they're treated in a, a way that's not dissimilar. And because they're being paid a wage, as I mentioned to you with the case um, of going to hospital, they're avoiding healthcare. So it's a little bit complicated to tease that out whether there is disparities. But what we will be able to do is look at the demography, the genetic information very clearly, and also align that very clearly with the type of health conditions and health status, shall we say, the well being of individuals and, and be able to map that on, on a much broader scale. Wonderful way to end. Uh, I should tell you that there are lots and lots of thank yous in the chat column. Thank you very uh, much. And, and a recognition that this is really a, a staggering project um, and uh, an immensely complex one. It's really wonderful. We see some uh, hand clappings, uh, reactions here. Um, it's all wonderful. We're going to end our hour on time uh, but I would like to say just a couple of quick words about the AIA and about upcoming events. Um, so um, I would like to, first of all, um, uh, recommend your support for the AIA. Uh, for those of you who have joined us this evening and are not members, um, I hope you will think about joining. I hope you will think about making the donation or a gift online. Uh, your generosity, generosity makes these programs possible. We're all 
And um, this is a, a, a wonderful uh, opportunity to support the AIA. Um, we always need members. For those who perhaps might have left your membership to lapse, now's the time to rejoin. For those who are interested in joining, you get uh, Archaeology Magazine, uh, a wonderful publication that comes out six times a year. Just go to archaeological.org slash join and you'll find all the information there that you need. There are a number of fantastic lectures, a, a really wonderful beginning to what looks like an absolutely packed series of top scholars on a, an incredibly wide range of subjects. So please join us for more of the 2022-23 virtual lectures. Tune in for the new AIA Archaeological Lecture Series, uh, as well as the return of the popular Archaeology of Bridge Talks. And you can learn more about these and register at archaeological.org slash lectures. Uh, if you are interested in other lectures with Chris, you're, here's Chris, you're in luck. Um, he's giving a, a, uh, an archaeological AIA hour tomorrow night at seven, a bit of a reprise. Um, but he's also speaking at Archaeology Abridged on Thursday, September 29th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, um, Healing the Body, colon, How Scientific Archaeology is Revealing the Medicinal Practices of Enslaved Peoples. Uh, again, looks like uh, uh, an amazing talk, and that will be Thursday, September 29th at 2 p.m. Everything you need to know for registration is at archaeological.org slash slash lectures. All right, last bit of news. Tune in next month. Um, Alaka Wali from the Field Museum in Chicago will be speaking for the West Coast crowd uh, on Tuesday, October 18th at 7 p.m. Pacific time, a repeat the following night at 7 p.m. October 19th. Inclusive Museum Narratives, colon, contextualizing collections through collaboration. Uh, and she'll also be giving an archaeology abridged talk the following week. Um, all this material is online. We hope you continue to join us for these free public talks. Uh, again, my name is Andy Goldman. I'm the president of the Spokane Society. We've been honored to be the host for uh, our first lecture of Lecture of Archaeology Hour. Please join us again uh, next month um, for Alakawali's talk. Thank you for coming this evening. Good night.